work of Wins McKay has always been a source of fascination and delight for me, ever since I first encountered his comic strip Little Nemo in Slumberland in the late 60s when I first went to college. I'm aware that he'll be familiar to anyone else with more than a passing interest in comic strips and animation, and if you're among them I apologise for telling you what you probably already know. But this is mainly for the uninitiated who haven't previously discovered the many visual wonders he created. The location and date of McKay's birth aren't certain, but it was probably in Michigan, probably in 1869. Even he didn't seem to know. He drew obsessively from the moment he could wield a pencil, but his father wanted him to get a proper job and sent him to business college in Michigan. McKay rarely attended classes and sneaked off to draw and sell cartoons to passers-by. With the money he made, he took some private art lessons and set off for Chicago in 1889, where he got a job in a printer's. A couple of years later, he moved to Cincinnati, and in 1898, he began a full-time job with the Cincinnati Commercial Tribune. At the same time, he also started freelancing for the humor magazine Life. By this point, he was in his late twenties, and his pen and ink technique was confident and descriptive. His hatching was highly controlled and he was able to create sophisticated solid monochromes ideal for newspaper and magazine printing. Two years later he was appointed head of the art department of the Cincinnati Enquirer and in 1903 he drew a comic strip of sorts for the paper based on a series of rhymes written by George Randolph Chester. This was a tale of the jungle imps, and despite much of its humour being racist in content, in visual terms it was a remarkably intricate and carefully constructed series of ink and watercolour images, illustrating key moments from the verse's narrative. But McKay seemed incapable of settling at any particular job, and before long he was on the move again, this time to the New York Herald, where he was employed to produce illustrations and editorial cartoons. In addition to his commitment to the editorial work, he continued to create more comic strips. Among them was 1904's Little Sammy Sneeze, which was quite popular and managed a two-year run. The strip gave a clear indication of McKay's surrealist humorous leanings and natural sense of the aesthetic. His longest running strip from this period, The Dream of the Rabbit Fiend, first appeared in the rival Evening Telegram in 1904. For this strip he was compelled to use the alias Silas because of the terms of his contract with the Herald. The Rabbit Fiend was aimed at an adult audience and it was unusual in that it didn't feature a recurring central character. But what they all had in common were fantastic, frequently terrifying dreams before waking up in the last panel, regretting the Welsh rabbit they had eaten the night before. And the rabbit theme was the first of McKay's creations to be considered popular enough to be published as a book in 1905. The premise of the strip was also used to make a short live action comedy film by producer Edwin Porter, which boasted the best special effects that were technically possible in 1906. A stage musical version was also planned, but it never saw the light of day. While still churning out a large volume of daily editorial work, McKay found the time to create yet more strips, including the story of Hungry Henrietta and A Pilgrim's Progress, which was another strip credited to Silas for the Evening Telegram. But most significantly, it was in 1905 that the full-page strip Little Nemo in Slumberland first appeared in the Sunday edition of the Herald. Thematically, Nemo was obviously derived from the basic narrative of the rabbit fiend, but as the title suggested, all episodes concerned the central character of the boy Nemo. The Welsh rabbit had gone, but in every week's instalment when Nemo went to bed, he would experience fabulous, surreal and occasionally disturbing dreams from which he awoke in the final panel. And on that most basic narrative thread hung a work which is rightly considered to be one of the greatest and most influential comic strip masterpieces. McKay experimented constantly with the structure of the comic's page. 
The layout was always different in each episode, and he took chances with the size and shapes of panels to enhance the visual quality of the page as a whole. The Herald was considered to have the highest quality colour printing of any newspaper at the time, and it used what is known as the Ben Day process, with solid and dot screen areas used carefully to create an illusion of full colour. McKay would draw the artwork as black and white line only and provide the printer with precise complicated instructions regarding the colours used. By this point, with Nemo riding high and other strips doing well, he was approached in 1906 to perform what were then called chalk talks for the vaudeville circuit. For $500 a week, which is over $14,000 in current value, he drew lightning sketches in a 15-minute act in front of live audiences, as the theatre band played a tune called Dream of the Rarebit Fiend. He toured with this act for over a year, during which time he continued to create artwork backstage and in his hotel for the weekly instalments of Nemo. In 1907, a staged musical version of Little Nemo in Slumberland was created and produced and it played to sold-out crowds, first in New York and then two seasons as a touring production. Unfortunately, it proved to be too expensive to produce, so it failed to make a profit and closed in 1910. In 1911, McKay was lured away from the Herald by the Hearst Publishing Empire to create editorial cartoons and illustrations for their newspapers for a higher salary and a promise of more artistic freedom. His departure led to a legal dispute over the ownership of copyright of Little Nemo, and it was eventually judged that the Herald held the rights to the title, but McKay owned the characters. So, all McKay had to do was to change the strip's title to In the Land of Wonderful Dreams, and that's how it continued to appear in Hearst's New York American paper. The Herald, meanwhile, did nothing with their ownership of the name, which without McKay was worthless. It was around this time McKay became increasingly fascinated with the possibilities of drawn animation. He wasn't the first, although he was frequently billed as such on posters and handouts. But although there had been several others before him, he was single-handedly responsible for establishing many of the practices which would become standard in later years. Between 1911 and 1921, he animated ten self-financed films, but unfortunately only a few sequences have survived. Undoubtedly his biggest success was with Gertie the Dinosaur, which he made in 1914. This animation was presented as an interactive theatre routine in which McKay appeared to give orders to Gertie, who would carry them out or not with comical outcomes. And McKay toured with this creation across America, playing to packed houses wherever he went. The public was suitably amazed and entertained, and Gertie made him a lot of money. He and the assistants he had hired took just under two years to produce his most technically ambitious film, The Sinking of the Lusitania, which was released in 1918. Despite its animated qualities, it didn't fare too well. The actual sinking by German U-boats had taken place almost three years previously, and few wanted to be reminded of the incident. By this time, his boss, William Randolph Hearst, had discovered just how little time McKay was devoting to his job at the New York American. In addition to being paid a generous salary for his editorial work, McKay was also earning yet more for his extramural activities. So, in 1917, McKay reluctantly agreed to give up entirely on his life performances and all other paid work outside the Hearst Empire although he was occasionally granted permission for one or two shows. And such was McKay's popularity with the readers of Hearst's papers, he managed to negotiate an increase in salary to cover the loss of his other income. In 1924, McKay's contract with the Hearst Empire expired, and despite the fact that he had been treated exceptionally well by his employer, he refused to renew, claiming he had not been paid a promised bonus. He returned once more to the Herald Tribune, where he was able to bring Little Nemo back to life with its original title, but it had lost momentum and become yesterday's big thing. 
Consequently, it ground to a halt in 1926. Despite the fact McKay had been so difficult to deal with, Hearst instructed his minions to entice him back to his empire yet again, and McKay accepted in 1927. So now there was no more Nemo and no more animation, and McKay reluctantly settled back into life as a satirical editorial and political cartoonist. And although this aspect of his career gets the least attention from his admirers, he was remarkably good at it, creating many potent images expressing popular concerns about the social issues of the day. And that's how it continued for McKay until 1934, when he suffered a stroke and died almost immediately. A few years after his death, most of the original artwork he had stored at his home was destroyed in a fire and only a few original drawings survived. But we still have what's left of his animation, and fortunately a large amount of printed work. And with a bit of luck, McKay's remarkable achievements will continue to inspire and fascinate, just like it did, and still does, with me. Thanks as ever for watching, and I hope you'll come back for the next one.